on the morning you wake to the end of the world. Take your body back to the kai, to the place our kupuna taught us life began. First pole, then coral, then slime, then a whole universe fitting into a space smaller than a grain of sand. Then air rising through the ocean, pulling the tides that make mountains, valleys, and the rivers that cut through them. Remember our Aina for all the ways she had fed us. In the quiet darkness before the blast, dive yourself back into the depth of creation, recalling all the times your world has ended before. In Hawaii, we have this saying that says, Ikaba ma mua, ikaba ma hope, which means the time in front of you and the time behind you. But kaba ma mua, the time in front of you, also means the past. And the time behind you, kaba ma hope, means the time that comes after or the future. And so one of the things that's kind of written into our understanding of time and space is that we always back into the future facing the past. We have so many beautiful sunrises here, but the sunrise was so unusual and so exceptional that Bruce said, I've got to go get the good camera and photograph it. And so there was that kind of recording of the sunrise on that day that was noticed by so many people. It was beautiful, but it was flaming and it was ominous all at the same time. I was born and raised in Hawaii. This has been my home for my entire life. I was excited to go into work Saturday. I was just finished getting ready and my phone alarm went off and I'm thinking, oh, it's gonna be like a flood alert. We get those a lot. But I looked down at it and I froze. Like I looked at it and I could not believe what I was looking at. You initially can't even process it. It's something you have to stare at for a moment and say, wait a minute, what is this? This is not possible. And then the fear jumps in. This could be possible. And straight away I realized if I'm getting this message, so is everyone across the island. The U.S. Pacific Command has detected a missile threat to Hawaii. A missile may impact on land or sea within minutes. This is not a drill. If you are indoors, stay indoors. If you are outdoors, seek immediate shelter. There was this impulse, first to be with loved ones. If people were with their kids, it was, you know, where do we go to protect them? How do we protect them? Our girls are seven miles away, and Bruce said, I, I don't know if this is real or not, but I need to be with them. What I should know, should absolutely know, that if this was real and there was a ballistic missile coming to us, that I would probably never see him again. My sister first woke me up while I was having my beauty sleep, and then they told us that they just got a text that there would be a missile attack and that we would have to hide very safely so we don't get hurt. So many people panicked. People were shoving their children, and this still haunts me, down storm drains against their will. 
you know, how do you explain it to a child that has no idea what this is, but that it doesn't make any rational sense that we would live in a world where we would have to do this. Hawaii is still home for me, even though I'm a long way away. My family is there. My friends that I grew up with are there. They are my people. That day I was reading in the library at Princeton where I study nuclear weapon issues. I remember seeing my phone out of the corner of my eyes start lighting up with message after message. Did you all get the missile alarm? I have no clue what we're supposed Sirens to do. Sirens were heard in Manoa, but no There's else. nothing on the news or the radio. Should we drive to somewhere with a base? My dad is going to Kualoa Ranch to help people into the bunkers. I'm freaking out. I don't have Jada with me. I'll have to drive to her. Tamara, how much time do we have? What can we do? My friends wanted answers. They wanted a way out and I knew I didn't have one to give them. If this alert was real, people on the ground had 15 minutes or less. Even if this were only an average-sized nuclear weapon, much of Honolulu would be flattened by the initial blast wave. Beyond the flames, radiation from fallout would poison the beaches and the forests. Our home would become toxic and sick. Suddenly, I stopped thinking about nuclear weapons in terms of technology or security. I thought of them in terms of my family, my home. I remember looking at my dad and he was just sitting there and he said, we're five miles from Pearl Harbor. There's nothing we can do. For it to suddenly come at what, like eight o'clock in the morning. Hey, what have you done with your life? And are you happy with that? Are you ready to just go right now? Is that, are you good with that? I quietly texted my best friend saying, I love you. I'm really proud of you, and I know you're going to do really good things with your life. As soon as I got onto our two-lane highway, there was a growing chaos all around me. People driving at high speed, some speeding already at about 90 to 100 miles an hour. I was already at 80 or 90 miles an hour cars driving across the median strip, people jumping out of their cars, running into stores, laying down in, in the aisles. We were all in our pajamas and we just were running and I started sobbing because I didn't want to die. I remember Jacqueline, she was really tired from all the running. She got on my dad's back ran to a building that is quite substantial, like somebody believed that there was some kind of a shelter in that building. As we got to the building, there was a huge surge of several hundred people and they were screaming at us, there's no room here, there's no room here, find somewhere else. So we just stood outside, horrified, terrified, thinking, you know, the people inside might make it and we're, we're not gonna make it. I remember looking up and everything seemed completely normal. My grandfather always used to tell us about war and how it was scary and how it changed him. And then he used to always talk about Pearl Harbor and how what he heard were just loud airplanes and they were flying over the mountains towards Pearl Harbor. And 
and he said he saw one plane just went straight down into one of the boats. So he saw everything. Let's keep in mind that Hawaii specifically is a nerve center for command control operations in the Pacific. Uh, enormous numbers of nuclear weapons are commanded from Hawaii and would be a target uh, if there were a major attack for that very reason. None of the political leadership had done anything to prepare for this kind of reality or to create a different reality, to create an alternative. They said to take cover. What a ridiculous thing to say to people in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Take cover? Well, let's just go paddle out into the ocean because there's literally nothing I can do in this moment. On the morning you wake to the end of the world. Chant all the names of our dead and dying. Refuse to forget Koho'olawe, Makua, Kohakuloa, Mokoli'i, and then look to the horizon. Call upon the memory of hundreds of tests carried across our oceanic backs. Bikini and Anewatak, Kirimati and Kalama, Meraringa and Imu, Maruloa and Fangara'ufa, and all the unnamed caught choking down wind. Epeli Hawofa's beautiful sea of islands vision perverted into a sea of toxic waste. The enduring gift from our American, British, and French protectorates. January 13th. 2018, 808 and 0 seconds AM. 911, please fire ambulance. Um, police, I guess. Emergency, non emergency. And I just got an alert on my phone saying there was a ballistic missile inbound. Yeah, we just got it too. It's happening to us right now too. So, what are we supposed to do? You know what? Let me get you to dispatch. 911, please fire ambulance. Hello? There's um, saying that there's a missile coming to Hawaii? Yeah, you know what? We just got, like, on our personal phones, too, and we're trying to look on the news. As much as you know, that's how much we know. Like, we're still trying to figure out what this whole message is about. I'm so sorry, sir. All lines are busy. Yeah, yeah we're right now we're getting inundated with calls, asking, and we don't have the answer right now because we just got it. We called emergency services and they didn't have any advice for us. Nobody was tweeting from government officials. There weren't any emergency news alerts. There was just nothing. It was radio silence. And then we were on our own. So I'm looking through social media. All I'm seeing are my friends and family freaking out, tweeting things like, is this real? Is this real? What do I do? I just kept thinking, we're going to feel all of the heat, there's going to be pain. In Hiroshima, they have the shadows of people burned into ground and walls from 
how hot and intense the blast was. And I kept thinking, like, what is my shadow going to look like? What is my silhouette going to look like? years old on the day 1945 I was on the way to school that morning everybody in school died and nobody survived if I'm born maybe a year later and I'm attending the elementary school I'm not here to talk to you when we see the flash and the big noise, our train stop. We all jump off. We saw that mushroom shape of a crowd. We don't know what's going on. So we start walking toward the Hiroshima city. the people start coming. I thought we were going into hell because those people are all burned and skin, arms and face, all the just peeling off and you cannot even tell men or women. That's the image that I can never forget. That happened 1945. We have no warning. Bang, it happened. But this one, 2018, I live in Oahu and I was sleeping. I wake up because of the noise. They say they go hide somewhere safe. And I say, what do you mean? I cannot hide in no place safe. If it's uh, coming, it's too late. So I decide I don't want to experience things I did in uh, our kids. So I don't want to be survivor anyway. Hiroshima was destroyed with a single bomb, which has defined the nuclear age for most people. But when you see a picture of the devastation, you are looking at what happens to a city when it experiences the explosion of a detonator of a modern thermonuclear weapon. Modern nuclear weapons have a destructive force tens to hundreds of times more powerful than those dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If one were detonated over a metropolis like New York, Tokyo, Paris, or London, over 15 square miles would be flattened by the initial blast. Almost 50 square miles would be consumed by fire. About one million people would die instantly. The scientists who designed nuclear weapons said it best. That in all-out nuclear war, the living would envy the dead. Yet there are still more than 14,000 nuclear weapons in the world. This is enough to destroy our entire planet many many, many times over. It doesn't matter who fires first or which nations are involved. The nature of military alliances and the fact that nuclear weapons are distributed widely around the world, even in countries outside the nine nuclear states, 
means that any nuclear launch has the potential to set off a chain reaction of counterstrikes and retaliations that destroys all life in this world. It might start with a single missile aimed at incapacitating our communication system, but the overall attack on each side it would be what are called a doomsday machine, killing everybody, not right away, but within months, depending on the food supplies nearby, or a year or so for the entire world. That hasn't affected our plan. The weapons continue to be built. In effect, we're ignoring it in the same way we've failed to prepare for the possibility of a pandemic. The idea that possessing nuclear weapons somehow protects a state or a population does not hold water. They put everyone at risk. Possessing nuclear weapons is a violent act. They are used every single day, regardless of whether or not they're actually detonated. We kind of thought that we were too powerful to take down or that it would never happen in our generation. We're too smart to use ballistic missiles like that anymore. And that's like a really Western privileged way of thinking about it, I think. I call it millennial hubris. When I arrived, my older daughter came out, who's 13. She said she was told to sit down and prepare to die. I looked in her eyes, and she was looking to me for comfort. She was looking for me to say it's going to be okay. There's no way to give a satisfactory explanation to your child as to why we live in a world that has nuclear weapons. I was pregnant at the time, and I didn't tell a lot of people because it was still very early. Having, you know, this life inside of me that I so helpless I couldn't do anything to protect. It was just heartbreaking. Even if we live through this, you know, what am I bringing this baby into? Like, like who's to say there's not another threat. I didn't call my daughter in Los Angeles until the last moment. But that's when I think this became most real for me. This is the child that I carried for nine plus months that I suckled at my breast, that I gave everything I could to. When she picks up, I say, but I just want you know, to know that I, I love you. I love you. And she says, I love you too, Mom. And then there's just silence. What if it escalated or if it was happening in other places, if we weren't the only people getting this ballistic missile alert? If this was the beginning of a civilization ending event, a collective death experience for all of humanity. On the morning you wake to the end of the world, call out the names of all the violences that have come while calling itself protection. All the ways we have been left to gather the shattered pieces, two island cities in the western corner of the Pacific, flattened to caricature, 
Names rendered meaningless carved over and over again into the blinding of our textbooks just enough of their shape remains to call foul at our hubris but does nothing to slow the arrogant push of progress all because the men with the plans called power promised us security behind the barrel of a gun but none of it will save us the violence that will continue to come. Bullets only beget more bullets. Bombs only beget bigger bombs and in the end... All we are left with is this waste, waiting. So we're just like scanning the horizon. So we're looking for something to crash on the ocean. It was such a powerful moment for us. It was almost as if it, it might have been the last moment of us being a family together. My son was scared and they kept saying, are we going to die? Are we going to die? I think my daughter was crying. And my son's like, can we pray, mommy? I never forget that because we don't pray. <laughs> we never pray. And we just sat there and we literally waited. I was crying and everybody was holding each other. We started to pray a little bit. Me just sobbing because I couldn't believe that I was about to die. And that's when I just noticed on my phone there was an alert. There was a notification from my best friend. The missile alert is false. It's a false alarm. Don't worry. Everything is okay. You're safe. What I felt in that moment was gratitude. Just. Everything was still the same, you know, and yet nothing was the same. It would never be the same. It was pandemonium in paradise after that alert was sent to phones throughout the state and broadcast on Members television. Members of Congress are demanding answers on why it took 38 minutes for a correction. Those responsible for this happening need to be held accountable and making sure that this cannot it cannot happen again. The FCC chairman called the false alert absolutely unacceptable and has launched an investigation. The people of Hawaii are justifiably livid. They demand answers, and so do we. Now fired from his job as a Hawaii state warning officer, the man responsible for sending the state into 38 minutes of chaos is speaking out. Facing death threats, he's requested anonymity. I was 100% sure that it was the right decision, that I heard this is not a drill, and uh, I didn't hear exercise at all. I'm really not to blame in this, but uh, it was a system failure. I can't say that I would do anything differently based on what I saw and heard. I read headline after headline, and I see that the focus is all about blame. You know, why are we so hell-bent on blaming someone who made a mistake and trying to fix it with some kind of redundancy that isn't going to make any kind of difference if there's a nuclear attack? Yes, of course, there was a mistake made, but that's the point. We have weapons of mass destruction, and we've made so many mistakes, and we've been so lucky. How have we survived every close call for all these decades? It was a false alarm, and we had a nuclear wake-up call, and we all had the gift of our lives returned. And so we now have to act. We have to make sure that this never happens. We can either wait for what almost happened in Hawaii to be a reality, or we can prevent it from ever happening anywhere in the world. There have been so many people affected by nuclear weapons in many different forms, and their voices are excluded from the elite debates about nuclear weapons by allowing and amplifying the voices of women, the voices of LGBTQ groups, communities of color, indigenous communities. We can start to see an alternative view. We don't have to accept the status quo.
the first step in creating something new is having the courage to imagine that we could live a different way. We really need to come away from this individualism into understanding what it means to be a part of a community. The best place you learn about how to be in community with other people and with your land and with your resources is from Indigenous people because they still know all those stories. It's not that the individual doesn't exist, but the individual is never at the front. That anywhere I walk, I'm not alone. Even if it's just my body standing there, right? I'm never alone. I have my ancestors. I have my community with me and beside me, both celebrating me and pushing me and holding me accountable. And we have a word in Hawaii. It's kuleana, and it means responsibility but it also means privilege. It also means authority. It's the closest thing we have to the word right. If we can cure apathy, if we can cure hopelessness, if we can cure individualism, honestly, there's no reason in my mind that I think that we couldn't live in a world that wasn't overrun by this like military industrial complex. Over the decades, we've become very used to treating nuclear weapons as a political issue, as a partisan issue, as an issue of security and of strategic stability. But this moment in Hawaii can remind us that it goes far beyond that. It's not about enemies or allies. It's about acknowledging our common humanity. We have the tools to lift the nuclear shadow. We just need to use them. On the morning you wake to the end of the world, remember, all of this violence is not enough to force our forgetting. Our water, our moana, has a memory, and we are made in her image together, meaning we are intimately connected and infinitely powerful. So who but ourselves to hold us accountable when none of what has been built will save us from what cannot be called back? Remember... This mo'o level, the air of change is heat. The air of life only rises from aina and kai. There is no part of you that is meant to survive when the cost is this place. On the morning you wake to the end of the world, your vision will be 2020. So use it. As the men with the plans called power call out from behind their screens to tell you to take cover, See beyond the violence of their contradiction, the enduring waste of their direction. Call upon your own mana to make a change. Choose to remember our Aina, this Kai, these Kuahivi, and all they have witnessed, even more they have endured, and still stand to protect us. Follow their wisdom. Come Armageddon or high water, hold them close. Pull a pule from your na'o. Call out to your Akua by name and commit to live your life in their image, no matter what the consequence. And maybe, just maybe, the world may not have to end again tomorrow.